Buddhasar and I welcome to the fourth episode of Apophatic Antifragility, and this is part three of the first section, Epistemological Deficiency. So in this section, we'll look over some of the conclusions of the preceding discussion, and we'll also look at some evidence from the suttas of the Buddha's views on the subject. So far, we have discussed the epistemological deficiency that due to bad education, the influence of media, etc., we have an epistemological deficiency. <laughs> Before the addict can be cured, he has to recognize his addiction. He has to admit, you know, hello, I'm Yanisar, and I'm an epistemological deficient. <laughs> Just like 12 steps, right? So, until we recognize this, we can't begin any process to overcome or mitigate the problem. So, first we have to admit we are not seeing reality as it actually is. Instead, what we're seeing is a set of simple linear designs that we create out of words and symbols and think that they describe reality. But as we saw in the example of the expectations of the benefits of life, actually they don't. People go to work every day and build up assets thinking that they'll continue to accumulate benefits throughout their lives. Well, what happens when tragedy strikes? What happens when they reach old age and finally death? How do they handle that? Well, they don't. They suffer. Why do they suffer? Because their picture of reality is different from the actual reality. Their linear description of human life is different from the nonlinear actuality. So because of this, this, this creates mental suffering, dukkha. And this mental suffering is far worse than any physical suffering because there's no cure other than changing your mentality, changing your thinking. So how can we change our life? Because now as it is, we do not see life as it really is, only a distorted reflection of it. And how do we distort our view of life? We oversimplify it. We think that things are going to go in pretty much a straight line, but they never do. We make plans, we create all kinds of expectations that things are going to go in a normal way, but they don't. So every time we encounter an unexpected event, we're surprised and we suffer. We're fragile. We're fragile to unpredictability, to volatility, to the unexpected event, the rare event the unpredictable event. It's only unpredictable because our model is wrong. And this ignorance is the cause of our suffering. We need a better model. So the Buddha is giving a better model. He is giving a view of reality that corresponds to the way it actually is. Buddha is very fond of that saying, yata, huh? like that. It, that's the way it is. That's really the way it is. So when we accept life the way it really is, then it doesn't surprise us when things happen. It's only because we superimpose a filter or a picture of reality that doesn't correspond to what really is. Unfortunately, by the time we encounter the Buddha's teaching, we already have so many bad habits. Uh, we're so used to applying, for example, Cartesian coordinates. Uh, you see any graph, it has two axes, X and a Y axis. Or if it's three-dimensional graph, it has X, Y, and Z axes. 
and they're all at right angles to one another, and they're all straight lines. Where do you see in nature straight lines? What to speak of straight lines at right angles to each other? Huh? Only humans think like that. We even build our buildings like that. There isn't a single curve in this building. It's all straight lines. Why do we do that? Because our minds crave simplicity and certainty that comes from it. Unfortunately, <laughs> life is not so simple. It's not linear. It's not straight. It doesn't have nice square corners. That's just the way it is. Yata <laughs> That's just the way it is. We can't change reality. But we can give ourselves a nice, comfortable, safe dream and think we know reality, think we have a theory that predicts reality, but actually it never does. So we need some more powerful epistemological tools so we can understand and apply the Buddha's message without distortion. Sometimes I hear these people, especially in the West, they're talking about Buddhism or Buddha's message. And it's unrecognizable. It doesn't sound anything like the Buddha. If you read the suttas, the way the Buddha spoke, he, he doesn't say any of those things. <laughs> Where are they getting these ideas? Well, they have created a, a different model. They have created a model full of square corners and straight lines. And now they're trying to apply that model to Buddhism. They're trying to overlay the Buddha's teaching with a Western conceptual model, a scientific model based on mathematical abstractions that only exists in our mind. It doesn't exist in nature. Nature does things in her own way. And it's not the way we would like it to be. So we're trying to superimpose our wishes, our desires, our concepts on nature, on reality. Of course it doesn't work. <laughs> and the tragedy of it is that that leaves us fragile, very easily influenced by the unexpected things that happen in life. So let's take a look at a few of these things, and then we'll examine what the Buddha has to say about it. Let's consider, for example, skill versus luck. And many times we'll see someone who's very successful. They have a lot of money or a lot of influence, fame. People admire them, try to emulate them, try to follow them. And we say, oh, that person's very talented. Look at what they did. Look at what they accomplished. So we infer by inferential reasoning huh, that because they have some success, they must have talent or skill. Is that really true? In most cases, no, it's not true. In most cases, people's success is due completely to luck. Many, if not most, Temporarily successful people, companies, etc., are merely lucky fools. They happen to be in the right place at the right time. They happen to get in to a new fad right in the beginning. Huh? Or they just happen to have, by the, uh, the luck of the draw, they have the genetics, huh? they have the looks, or they have the social mannerisms that confer success has nothing to do with talent, has nothing to do with skill, it's luck. And how, how do we know this? Because as soon as something unexpected takes place, they fall. As soon as the, uh, what was it, the, the owner of a basketball team was found to be a racist, he made some racist comments to his girlfriend in the privacy of his bedroom not knowing that she was recording. <laughs> and she went public. And now he's going to lose his basketball team. Everybody hates him. So he goes from being a successful person to being a social outcast overnight. Why? Something unexpected happened. Somebody he trusted betrayed him. 
Something that he said in the privacy of his own room suddenly goes out to the whole world. Now he has to deal with the consequences. So this is always the case in life. We plot out a nice straight course of success and then something comes up and blows the whole thing up, pops our bubble, it busts our run, and we find ourselves scrambling, struggling to deal with it. Well, why? Only because we didn't expect it. But if we look at life the way it really is, these things happen. Friends betray us. Money gets stolen. Things break. The weather goes bad on us. It's just life. That's the way it is. Yata buta. That's the way it is. We put our pretty picture between ourselves and life to try to screen ourselves from the randomness that causes suffering. But the randomness gets to us anyway. And later on in the next section, we'll see how science is a perfect expression of this tendency to uh, wishful thinking about life. <laughs> so most successful people are lucky idiots, huh? lucky fools. They're in the right place at the right time, riding a synthetic market bubble, only to be wiped out by the next black swan. Now, a black swan event, as we explained in the last time, is something unexpected, something unpredictable. And of course, the only reason it's unpredictable is because we're trying to predict <laughs> in the first place. We're trying to predict and we want to predict a future that's everything we want it to be. Does nature care? No. Nature does things her own way. She doesn't care about our little plans. So we tend to only see what we want to see. And what we want to see is ourselves, prosperous, successful, influential, beloved, and so on, in the future. So when that doesn't happen, then we're cast into self-doubt. Why didn't I see that coming? Why didn't I know that that was going to happen? Well, there was no way to know. <laughs> the mistake we made was we assumed things were going to go straight and they didn't. But this is called, uh, technically speaking, survivorship bias. Uh, we only see the survivors. We don't see the ones that didn't make it. We see the successful businessman and, and we ask him, well, what's your secret? He says, I get up early in the morning and I work hard every day of my life and I hired only the best people and so on. And so he gives his advice to how he became successful. Well, guess what? There are a hundred other businessmen who did the same thing, got up early, worked hard, tried to hire the best people and so on, and they didn't make it. They failed. And actually, it's only a matter of time before the successful one fails as well. The thing is, their number came up early and his number is coming up late. His black swan hasn't hit yet. That's the only difference. So many people are trying to become rich, famous, whatever. And they have different methods, different approaches. So you only have to be right 51% of the time to last for quite some time in any business. But as soon as that 1% comes that you're wrong, then you're finished. All it takes is one black swan. Look at the stock market crash of 1929, or the stock market crash of, uh, what was it, 1988, uh, 1986, or whatever it was. And then there was another one just in 2008, uh, where there was a, a deep market instability caused by a lack of trust among the central banks. Almost scuttled the whole global financial uh, system. So anything can happen anytime. And if we build a model that is dependent on something remaining stable or predictable, that model will fail. And the only people that we see are successful, continuously successful, simply haven't reached that point of failure yet. They are the lucky but foolish winners. Uh, they're the survivors. They're the ones that made it. The only reason they made it is that they had uh, 
the wind at their back. They had a, a lucky run because that's the way life is. Life is always coming up with surprises and derailing our little plans. This leads to overestimation of skill versus randomness or luck in success and consequently an underestimation of risk. We think, oh, if I just follow um, the uh, Business Week uh, 10 Secrets of Successful People, <laughs> then I'm going to make it. Well, you might make it for one year, two years, five, 10, 20. But at some point, something that you can't deal with is going to come up. You have to be prepared. If you're all in on your investment and you don't have any savings, you don't have any backup, and something comes along you didn't expect, you can't deal with it. You're not prepared. It's like driving without insurance. Sooner or later, you're going to have an accident. Almost everybody does at some point in their lives. And that accident is probably going to be a financial disaster. That's why people have insurance. And in many cases now, it's the law. You have to have insurance or it's illegal to drive. So in that way, people go through life without insurance, without a safety net. They predict a certain reality. And if that reality doesn't happen as predicted, then there isn't anything they can do. They can't deal with it. To continue with this model that arbitrarily overlays a simplified version of reality based on straight lines and simple curves always leads to disaster. It always leads to being overwhelmed by unpredictable events. It's just like the tide comes in and the tide goes out. So the lucky idiots are buoyed by the incoming tide and then they're drowned as the tide pulls out. It's just a matter of timing. If you happen to get in early on the incoming tide, you can go quite far. But at some point, the tide is going to turn and you're going to be sucked out to sea and drowned. That's just the way life is. I'm sorry. Yata buta. Life is, is hard. It's difficult. And then you die. <laughs> it's true. So people are making all kinds of plans, but they're not making plans for death. So always in the background, there's this inevitability of death lurking. We know it's coming, but we don't know when, and we don't know how. Yet, how many people have made plans for their death? I mean, both personal plans and plans for their external affairs. How many people, other than maybe buying life insurance, which they really should call death insurance. But you see, we don't like to discuss this subject, death, because it's one of those unpredictable things. And we don't like unpredictable things. We like everything to be nice and predictable and smooth and linear. But life isn't linear. You're going to hear me say this maybe a thousand times. <laughs> life is nonlinear. And if you structure your life and position your life in such a way that you're expecting, you're counting on linearity, then when unlinear things happen, when nonlinear events hit, you'll be at a tremendous disadvantage. For an example, middle class people getting rich on stock, real estate, and the unlimited credit bubble in the 1990s, then going bankrupt in the 2000s. What happened? The banks created this credit bubble. All of a sudden, there was like almost zero interest. In some cases, actually zero interest between the banks. And so people went crazy buying houses because real estate always goes up, right? Yeah, until it goes down. <laughs> when they say always, what they really mean is within our memory or within our time frame. But everybody's time frame is limited. If you look at a longer timeline of history, everything goes up and down. Land, houses, credit, buildings, whatever. Nothing remains the same. Everything is impermanent. That's the first lesson of the Buddha, huh? Anicca. Nothing is permanent. Nothing is eternal. So if interest rates are low today, that means they can only go up, right? Because they're not going to stay the same. They're going to change. 
This is called contrarian, contrarian strategy. If we think that everything's going to remain nice and smooth and just stay just the way it is, then that strategy is doomed to failure. That's a fragile strategy. It's fragile to the black swan, to volatility. So what we need is an anti-fragile strategy that actually thrives on volatility and takes advantage of unexpected events, even though they're unpredictable. To do that, we have to give up our desire for certainty. And that's very difficult. But all great truths at first seem difficult and counterintuitive. If we have to give up certainty and the simplicity that creates the illusion of certainty, well, what are we going to replace it with? Well, we can't. There is no certainty in life. Rather, we have to begin to see that we are creating these artificially simplistic views of life. And this puts us in danger. This makes us fragile to the volatility of life, the unexpectedness of life, the randomness. So let's take a, a look at a, a case study of the Buddha's comments about death. Are you prepared for death or not? Uh, are you ready? Death is imminent. It's coming. We all know this. The saying is like death and taxes. It's certain that death will come to all of us. When? We don't know. How? We don't know. But we can be certain that it will come. So our attitude toward death, our strategy for death, is one of the most important aspects of an anti-fragile existence. How can we live in such a way that we are not harmed by death? The Buddha taught mindfulness of death. The Blessed One said, Mindfulness of death, when developed and pursued, is of great fruit and great benefit. It gains a footing in the deathless, has the deathless as its final end. Therefore, you should develop mindfulness of death. Why? It gives a footing in the deathless. Don't try to understand this intellectually or philosophically. You have to practice the Buddha's teaching to taste this. Uh, that if you resign yourself to death, if you accept the inevitability of death, if you reconcile yourself with the imminence of death, things go much smoother in life. And you gain a certain psychological advantage over people who don't have this awareness, this mindfulness of death. The Buddha goes on. Whoever develops mindfulness of death, thinking, oh, that I might live for the interval that it takes to breathe out after breathing in, or to breathe in after breathing out, that I might attend to the Blessed One's instructions, I would have accomplished a great deal. They are said to dwell heedfully. They develop mindfulness of death acutely for the sake of ending the effluence. So not that we should think, well, death is coming someday, maybe 10, 20 years from now. I have plenty of time to prepare. That means you're not going to prepare. Who is prepared for death? Someone who thinks, well, maybe I can live long enough to get this sentence finished. <laughs> He's ready for death because death can come at any time. At any time, I could have a stroke. I could have a coronary embolism and, and just keel over and die right in, the, right in front of the camera. <laughs> Who knows? Huh? We have to be uh, okay with that. We have to be prepared for that. We have to be uh, mindful of death to the point where we wouldn't be disturbed if death comes at any time. We wouldn't resist it. We wouldn't cling to life. It may seem like a tall order, but if you can, if you can do this with death, then you're really set up. You know, we talked about this way back in the series on being in the world, how imminent death is there for everyone and how a person's attitude toward death really shapes their life in, in so many ways, especially their decision-making and their authenticity. 
that a person who's mindful of death, making every decision as if it might be his last, uh, performing every activity as if it might be the last thing he does. Huh? If it's the last thing I do, <laughs> well, it just might be the last thing you do. So do it in such a way that it would be a fitting uh, remembrance of your real self, your real intention in life. And uh, don't play with life, but lead life uh, as if it's going to leave you at any moment. That's mindfulness of death. Now, death only happens once in a lifetime. So by definition, it's an improbable event. The Buddha talked about improbability quite a bit. For example, the Buddha talked about, uh, and in the suttas there's descriptions of, the improbability of a Buddha. While the Buddha was staying in the market town of Apana, in the country of Anguttaripa, Sela, a leading Brahmin teacher, heard from Kaniya, the matted-haired ascetic, the word Buddha. As soon as he heard the sound Buddha, it occurred to him, rare indeed it is in the world, even to hear the utterance Buddha, Buddha. Not long after, together with 300 followers, he gained monkhood, and seven days thence he attained arhantship with them. That's a cool story, because it shows that uh, Sela, the Brahmin, understood the rarity, the improbability, the sheer unexpectedness of the appearance of a Buddha. Now, they're working on construction our, on our lab next door, so you have to put up with the hammering, okay? Sorry. He understood how rare the appearance of a Buddha is, and so he took refuge in the Buddha without delay. Not only him, but his 300 followers. And in seven days, he attained arhatship. Now, you see, this is the kind of a person that's hard to find. In fact, impossible to find these days. A person who is ready to immediately take refuge in the Buddha, as soon as he hears the Buddha's teaching, he recognizes the rarity, the unpredictability, the improbability of it, and says, oh, this is a great opportunity. Let me take shelter and let me apply this teaching immediately uh, with such intensity that I attain our hardship. So this is the point to understand how fragile life is, how unpredictable it is, and how special it is when someone comes into our lives that has this truth, uh, this anti-fragile truth that transcends ordinary reality, that we should make every effort to take refuge in that person's teaching and to execute it to the best of our ability and attain its result. So there's another one. We have come from afar to look upon the Tathagata, for rare in the world is the arising of Tathagatas, Arhats, fully enlightened ones. So the people in the Buddha's time came from far away, sometimes from outside of India, on long journeys in caravans, walking, or on camels or carts. Ox carts. If you ever traveled by ox cart over a muddy dirt road, <laughs> it's not uh, United Airlines. <laughs> you can't believe the hardships that people went through just to have a glimpse of the Buddha. What to speak of becoming his disciple? Huh? They went through incredible things. And when they heard his teaching, they immediately applied it and got the benefit. That's the difference between a person of integrity, uh, a person with mindfulness of death, and a person who's living in a dream world. In fact, let's talk about the improbability of integrity. The Buddha said, Who in this world is a man constrained by conscience, who awakens to censure like a fine stallion to the whip? Those restrained by conscience are rare. Those who go through life always mindful. Having reached the end of suffering and stress, they go evenly through what is uneven, 
go in tune through what is out of tune. You see, so everything we're saying is mirrored in this statement by the Buddha. Life is uneven. It's not a straight line. Huh? It's out of tune. It's all these jangling dissonant notes that clash and conflict with one another. What to speak of our little plans, <laughs> our, our tiny defective intelligence. Uh, life just really, uh, you know, has other ideas. <laughs> so if we go through life always mindful, then we'll be restrained by conscience. We won't hurt anyone else. We won't cause suffering for anyone else or for ourselves. Because we know, we have absolute certainty what the result of that is going to be. We're going to suffer. So instead of suffering, we end our suffering. So the Buddha says, those who have integrity go through life always mindful, having reached the end of suffering and stress. In other words, they're enlightened. They're arhats. If someone really has integrity, it means they're enlightened. The Buddha doesn't make a, any distinction between having integrity and enlightenment. In other words, if you're enlightened, you have integrity. If you have integrity, you're enlightened. There's no sharp difference. And we'll get into this in the next episode. How the Buddha looks at reality and how he expresses that view. So a person like that can go through life, even though life is out of tune, uneven, full of struggle and pain. He can go through it without suffering. Pain, as I've often said, is inevitable. Suffering is optional. It's really our wrong view that creates suffering. So let's talk some more about the improbability of a Tathagata. The Buddha explained this to his disciples. Monks, Suppose that this great earth were totally covered with water and a man were to toss a yoke with a single hole there. Some versions of this have a plank. Imagine a plank with a knot hole and throw it on this great ocean. A wind from the east would push it west. A wind from the west would push it east. A wind from the north would push it south. A wind from the south would push it north. And suppose a blind sea turtle were there. It would come to the surface once every hundred years. Now, what do you think? Would that blind sea turtle coming to the surface once every hundred years stick his neck into the yoke with a single hole? Monks. It would be sheer coincidence, Lord, that the blind sea turtle coming to the surface once every hundred years would stick his neck into the yoke with a single hole. In other words, it's a black swan. It's a highly unpredictable, completely chance event. It's random. The Buddha here, he is talking about improbability, the variations of chance, the toss of the dice, uh, that the turtle comes once in a hundred years to the surface and he's going to stick his head through, just through the knot hole in this little plank or this uh, raft or whatever it is. It's so improbable. It's, the, the probability or the predictability of it is practically zero. The Buddha goes on. It's likewise a sheer coincidence that one obtains the human state. It's likewise a sheer coincidence that at the Tagata, worthy and rightly self-awakened, arises in the world. It's likewise a sheer coincidence that a doctrine and discipline expounded by a Tathagata appears in the world. Now this human state has been obtained. A Tathagata, worthy and rightly self-awakened, has arisen in the world. A doctrine and discipline expounded by a Tathagata appears in the world. Therefore, your duty is the contemplation this is stress. This is the origination of stress. This is the cessation of stress. Your duty is the contemplation. This is the path of practice leading to the cessation of stress. So in other words, the Buddha is saying, there is never a better time than now because we have a human body 
And the Buddha has appeared recently, only 2,600 years ago. And he has given his teaching. And that teaching has been propagated throughout the world. What a fortunate time we're living in. We should take advantage of that. Our duty is to inquire into these four noble truths. The truth of suffering, the origin of suffering, the cessation of suffering, and the path to cessation of suffering. Nothing else is not to have a comfortable life. It's not to maximize our bank account or our sense enjoyment or our fame or social influence. These things are trivial because they disappear at death. But by following the Buddha's teaching, we can gain a foothold in the deathless. And that's what we want. That's why we're here. We can become anti-fragile even to death. Another reason why we should take immediate action is that we have underestimated the danger. We have underestimated our exposure to risk. We have uh, set out a nice rosy story of how the future is going to be, and we're ignoring the actual dangers of life. Here's another nice quote. Monks, these five future dangers are just enough when considered for a monk, heedful, ardent, and resolute, to live for the attaining of the as yet unattained, the reaching of the as yet unreached, the realization of the as yet unrealized. Which five? There is the case where a monk reminds himself of this. At present I am young, black-haired, endowed with the blessings of youth in the first stage of life. The time will come, though, when this body is beset by old age. Furthermore, the monk reminds himself of this. At present, I am free from illness and discomfort, endowed with good digestion, not too cold, not too hot, of medium strength and tolerance. The time will come, though, when this body is beset with illness. In Ayurvedic medicine, the uh, irregularity in the process of digestion is considered to be the original cause of all illness. Uh, because of uh, irregular uh, digestion, either too hot or too cold or too strong or too weak. Uh, a person's food is not digested properly, and then various ailments come uh, uh, manifest uh, based on the weakness of the digestion. Furthermore, the monk reminds himself of this. At present, food is plentiful. Alms are easy to come by. It is easy to maintain oneself by gleanings and patronage. The time will come, though, when there is famine. Food is scarce, alms are hard to come by, and it is not easy to maintain oneself by gleanings and patronage. When there is famine, people will congregate where food is plentiful. There they will live packed and crowded together. Does this sound familiar? It sounds like modern life, doesn't it? Because in the olden days, all the necessities of life, all the food required for healthy life, were grown within the immediate vicinity of every village and town. There, was, there wasn't, you know, international shipping and, and uh, commerce of foodstuffs. Everything was locally grown and traded among uh, villagers. So without even going far away uh, from a village, you could get all the necessities of life. Not now. Now, if you want milk, either, if there's no store, you have to go to a milk farm, not any ordinary farm. Only certain farms produce milk. Only certain farms produce grain or soybeans or vegetables. And they're not all in the same place. They're scattered here and there according to climate, the best climate for that particular crop because of monoculture. Now, food is hard to come by. So what happens? People live packed together in cities. Uh, and all the necessities have to be brought into them. And if anything goes wrong, they're fragile. See, they'll suffer. Furthermore, the monk reminds himself of this. At present, people are in harmony, on friendly terms, without quarreling, like milk mixed with water, viewing one another with eyes of affection. 
The time will come, though, when there is danger and an invasion of savage tribes. Taking power, they will surround the countryside. When there is danger, people will congregate where it is safe. There they will live, packed and crowded together. And of course, <laughs> when people are living out of fear, huh, like they are today, packed into cities and towns, because of fear of nature, fear of enemies, fear of uh, lack of economic and social opportunities, then you can't meditate. There's too much noise, too many interruptions, pollution. Uh, it's, it's a horrible condition. So furthermore, the monk reminds himself of this. At present, the Sangha, in harmony, on friendly terms, without quarreling, lives in comfort with a single recitation. The time will come, though, when the Sangha splits. And of course, at this point in time, the Sangha has not only split, it has splintered into thousands of different views. Uh, it's been a long time since there was a single recitation, a single canon, uh, a single authorized edition of the Buddha's teaching. And uh, all the sects disagree, and they all fight with one another. They're not on good terms. I can't even go, uh, you know, to the monasteries where the monks wear the bright orange colors. I can't even go there. Then we'll get in an argument. <laughs> so it's really too bad. When these five things happen, it is not easy to pay attention to the Buddha's teachings. It is not easy to reside in isolated forest or wilderness dwellings. Thus he resolves. Before these unwelcome, disagreeable, displeasing things happen, let me first make an effort for the attaining of the as yet unattained, the reaching of the as yet unreached, the realization of the as yet unrealized, so that, endowed with that Dhamma, I will live in peace even when old. This is the message of the Buddha. And we can see, now that we're aware of it, the themes of fragility and anti-fragility, of the improbable and unlikely events, uh, of the future that has no promise of being like the past. See, these are fundamental attitudes of the Buddha, of the enlightened people. Uh, they're, they're more or less assumed to be understood by anyone who has a developed mind. But because of wrong education, because of wrong living, bad habits, too much sense enjoyment, a desire for a comfortable life, and so on, we don't follow this advice. And instead, we have created a huge superstructure of abstractions, of oversimplified expectations, linear plans and predictions for the future. And then when these things don't happen, we're surprised. <laughs> Actually, it's surprising when they do happen. It's surprising, it's unusual, when a person is successful using the models that we have available today. That's why we call them lucky fools. Uh, because their success isn't really due to any skill or intelligence. It's simply due to luck. Their black swan hasn't come yet. Huh? It was my good fortune, actually, that uh, four years ago, my whole life fell apart. That everyone betrayed me and left me alone. And I had to go back to the beginning and search out what is true and what is real. All over again from the beginning. Because this time, I was very fortunate. I found the Buddha's teaching. And knowing these dangers, that anything can go wrong at any time, I took full shelter, I took refuge of the Sangha, and I became a monk. So, I Buan, may you live long, happy life. Buddha Sar and I, Buddha bless you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.